but another is the symbolism of the number 12 tied to the New Jerusalem. So notice here, it says that the city has 12 gates, and at those gates are 12 angels, and on the gates are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, right? So think here of the tribe of Reuben or Simeon or Levi or Judah. Each one of these gates has the name of a tribe or a son of Jacob on it. And then also there are the 12 foundations. And this is interesting that the 12 foundations have on them not the 12 names of the 12 sons of Jacob, but the 12 names of the 12 apostles of Christ, right? So Peter and Andrew, James and John, right? Thomas, Bartholomew, all of the names of the apostles, presumably here with the inclusion here of Matthias, right? Who is the replacement of, of Judas, right? So what's, what John is showing us here, this is fascinating. To the extent that the New Jerusalem is an image of the church, of the church triumphant, of the bride of Christ, Notice that the way you get into the church, the access, is through the Old Covenant, right? You have the 12 tribes of Israel. But the foundations of the church are the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it's a very powerful image that we actually see elsewhere in, in Revelation 2 of the old and the new together in the church. Right? So, for example, pre earlier in the book of Revelation, you'll see the 24 elders having these 24 thrones. And you might think, well, wait, is the number 24 significant in, in Scripture? Well, not on its own, but when you recall that each of uh, the 12, well, that 12 plus 12 makes 24, uh, it, it's a symbol of the plenitude of the righteous, not just from the new covenant, but from the old covenant as well, coming together in the one church of Christ. Right? And then the third aspect of the New Jerusalem that John highlights, it's really fascinating, is that unlike the earthly Jerusalem, where the center of the city was the temple, right? I mean, if you go to, even to this day, people will go to the, the Dome of the Rock. There's a Muslim mosque up there now, but that's where the temple used to be. And then the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall were the foundation stones for the temple in Jerusalem. And that holy site is still the central site in the earthly city of Jerusalem. Well, for John, who would have made pilgrimages to the earthly Jerusalem and to the temple in particular during his life as a Jew, one of the striking things he notices about the new Jerusalem is there's no temple. Now, if you say there's no temple, the first thing a Jew might think is, oh, then God's not present there, right? Because the temple was the dwelling place of God. But what John does is he qualifies that. He says, I saw no temple in the city because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. So just as the earthly temple was the visible sign of the invisible presence of God in the earthly Jerusalem, now in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, there isn't a need for a visible sign of God's presence because his actual presence is the temple itself. So the temple is the presence of God and the Lamb in this mystical new Jerusalem. So very, very powerful imagery there. On the one hand, you could say there's a new temple, which is Christ. On the other hand, you could say there's no temple because the temple was both a sign of presence, but also a barrier too, right? It, it was meant to point to something invisible. But in the new Jerusalem, the risen Christ is visible, right? And is fully present. So there's no need for a stone temple or a place of mortar and brick to symbolize invisible presence. We could say much more, but that'll do for now. In closing, I just want to highlight here something significant in this description of the New Jerusalem. And it's the relationship between the New Jerusalem and the apostolic church. Let's shift gears for just a second. This is important. When I say the word church, what do you think about? Right? Many people will think first and foremost of the earthly institution of the church, right? So if you're Catholic, you probably think of the Roman of the Catholic Church, right? The, the communion of bishops in uh, the body of bishops and faithful in communion with the successor of St. Peter, right? Oh. And that's good. That's, that's a good time. If you're from another Christian tradition, you might think of your local church or even maybe your national church, right? If you're in the Orthodox tradition, like the Russian Orthodox Church. But in Scripture, although the church can have different manifestations on earth, what John here is describing is the heavenly church, or what we sometimes call the church triumphant, 
which is embodied in this vision of the New Jerusalem. And what I can't help but notice as I look at that is that the foundation of the church, although it is, of course, Christ, right? He's the ultimate. He's the cornerstone. Revelation is really clear that the foundation of the church are the 12 apostles. So every time we profess the creed, we say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. What does that mean, apostolic? It doesn't just mean that the church I belong to comes down through visible history, through the apostles and their successors. It means that. But it also means that the church to which I belong participates in a real way in the heavenly reality of the new Jerusalem, which is founded on 12 foundation stones of the 12 apostles. That the church participates in the triumphal reality, the mystical reality, the glorious reality of the invisible heavenly church in which the triune God dwells, whose gates are the 12 tribes of the old covenant and whose foundations are the 12 apostles of the new covenant. And with that in mind, just one last point. You know, sometimes Catholics are criticized by non-Catholic Christians for putting too much emphasis on the church, right? In fact, sometimes our Protestant brothers and sisters will say, you know, um, well, we might be sola scriptura, but you all are sola ecclesia. Like, we put all our focus on the Bible, but you put all your focus on the church, like the church alone. And my response to that would be that in one sense, that's actually true. Because if you look at Revelation 21, what is salvation? What is the ultimate destiny of all humanity other than the church? This is what John's describing. He describes the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, which is the church triumphant, as if they're one thing. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, there is no salvation apart from the church, anything any more than there is salvation apart from being a member of the new Jerusalem. When you look at the new Jerusalem, what is it other than the church? Not only is it centered on Christ, right, on the Lamb, but also it's founded on the 12 apostles, right? The very foundations of the new Jerusalem are the 12 apostles. So if there's no salvation outside of the heavenly Jerusalem, then it follows that there's no salvation outside of the apostolic church because the new Jerusalem is nothing other than the church which Christ has founded on the 12 apostles. That's why it says the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. In other words, what the book of Revelation is revealing, what the church fathers see here, and what the book of Revelation is revealing is that the church is not just an earthly institution, that even the apostolicity of the church is not just a historical reality or an institutional reality, but that it's a mystical reality. It's a heavenly reality in which the church and the pope and the bishops and the faithful continue to participate as we await the final coming of Christ on the last day, when the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly church will be united as one, right? In this new Jerusalem, in this new creation, in this new heaven, in this new earth.